In this, our last class in this module, we're going to be looking at Marriage and Family for Life. By that I mean having a sense of vision of goals for our family. I think too often the family is lived in the heat of the moment. Uh, dealing with the problems that come up uh, from time to time, uh, fighting the alligators, uh, just trying to keep our lives and our relationships together. But I think that it requires much more than that. It requires an intentionality, uh, a sense of purpose, of calling, of the fact that God has a plan for our families and that we want to fit within those plans and we want to be a part of seeing the unfolding of those plans. We learned in our last study uh, from perhaps the most positive example of all God our Father, and how our Father parents us provides a pattern for how we're to parent our own children. But we can also learn from negative examples. We can learn from people's mistakes. For example, the life of Eli and his sons. Eli was the high priest of God's people during the early time of their living in the Promised Land after having uh, conquered it. And Levi didn't parent his children very well. And the result of that was that the children were disobedient, they brought grief to themselves, to Eli, to the whole nation of Israel. And I think the main point, if we look at 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 12 through 36, the main point that we learn here is that if parents expect their children to love the Lord, they have to, by example, love the Lord as well. If we want our children to show restraint, we will have to show restraint. Eli's sons certainly didn't show that restraint, as we can see in verses 17 and 25, in that they wanted the best parts of the sacrifice, and they wanted them now. And they were not about to wait. They were not about to hold back. Eli himself also shows a lack of uh, restraint in verse 29. If we expect our children to respect authority, we will also have to respect authority. Eli's sons certainly showed a lack of respect for Eli when he confronted them. They showed a lack of respect for God's law, a lack of respect for God's people. Eli also showed a lack of respect in verse 29. If we want our children to respond to God's correction, we have to be responding to God's correction. Eli's sons refused to listen to him, refused to even uh, take his word seriously. God, uh, when God confronts Eli, Eli doesn't really take it seriously either. Uh, whatever will be, will be, such as... It is, it is, and doesn't really take to heart that he needs to do something about his family. And so, like father, like son. Sadly, Eli wasn't the only one that didn't parent his children properly. Uh, Eli's sort of surrogate son, Samuel, uh, should have seen... Eli's mistakes lived out in 
Eli's son's lives and learned from that as he was growing up within the temple. But later on, Samuel becomes so busy with his work as the leader of God's people, as something of a priest and something of a prophet, that he doesn't really train his sons either. And the result is that as the sons grow up, they prove to be unfit leaders and God's people can see it. And they ask Eli, uh, Samuel to appoint for them instead a king. What happened here, their failure to have goals, to set goals, to follow those goals. Now, I think sometimes we can have the wrong goals for our children. We can have the wrong goals for ourselves as well. Perhaps at times our goal is to have children who look good, who make us look good, who are obedient, who follow the rules, who say the right things, uh, who are model citizens. But unfortunately, that looks at it from an outward perspective. That assumes that as children are outwardly obedient, that must be a reflection of where their hearts are. And that isn't necessarily true. Let's take, for example, the case of the prodigal son. The older son certainly outwardly was very obedient to his father and obeyed him, but inwardly was seething that his father wasn't loving him and caring for him as he thought he should be, and it comes out later. We need to pray for our children's salvation instead of assuming that it's going to happen. And we need to understand that it's going to come from God. It's not going to come from external rules. It's not going to come from our efforts, uh, our uh, trying to produce a boundary in which our children can live and that uh, looks good to other people. We also can have the wrong goals for ourselves. Sometimes for parents, in the hecticness of raising their children, they just want to get through it. They simply want to survive. And I think that sometimes the attitude that parents of teenagers uh, have, if we can just get them through this, these few years, keep them from killing themselves, keep them from exhausting us and driving us crazy, then maybe we will get through it and we'll be okay on the other side. It's almost something of a belief in magic. If we can just wait it out, magically our children will be okay again after a couple of years. Uh, we simply may be assuming that maybe it's some alien person that's taking our children over. Uh, we don't recognize them as the sweet little children that we once saw growing up within our homes. Now they seem bent on pushing the envelope and challenging us every step of the way. And we wonder what demon has possessed them. And if we can just get them through this time, then everything will be okay. Uh, David Tripp, in his excellent book, Age of Opportunity, points out that the teenage years can actually be great years of growing ourselves spiritually and growing our children spiritually, working together to grow in Christ's likeness. He points out that if our children are struggling in an area of submission to us, it may be that God is trying to get our attention to show us that we're struggling with him in that same area of obedience. And so as we learn from our children, we provide an example to them of how to properly uh, deal with an area that, where we need growth. They see us trying to grow and we're very transparent with them. We share with them our struggle in that area that um, we understand their struggles because we have the same ones. And here's what we're trying to do. And if they would watch us and help us and pray for us that we be more obedient in those areas, 
that we would do the same for them. And so together we actually are working on Christ's likeness. Let's consider Colossians chapter 2 verses 20 through 23. Uh, what these verses reveal is that simply having the right outward goals is not going to do it. Uh, outward versus inward. Uh, trying to accomplish certain things outwardly actually results in just the opposite happening. Uh, a case in point is in Romans chapter 7. Uh, let me read there for you from uh, beginning with verse 7. What shall we say then? That the law is sin by no means? Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin, for I would not have known what it was to covet. If the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. Let me put that into some maybe more easy to understand concepts and words. Have you ever noticed how when you say to your children, don't do something, that immediately awakens in them that attitude of, oh yeah, who says? We find it in our own lives. When God tells us not to do something, we maybe had never even thought of doing that. Now it's all we can think about. And so what happens is that the law provides an occasion, uh, something of, an, uh, of a stimulus. It bubbles that sin to the surface and brings it out. It's been there all along, but now it comes to the surface where we can see it. Children are a possession of God, and we are simply stewards of them. We're raising them up to be like Him. And so that has to be part of our goal. We want to develop children who exist in a world that is seen, but who live for a world that is unseen. We want them to have that long-term eternal perspective. We want them to recognize that there's more than just this life. We want to, them to live uh, inwardly and for the Lord and by the Spirit. Also, we want to develop spiritual warriors who battle for God's kingdom. Uh, Psalm 127 seems to bring that idea out. We are raising prayer warriors. We are raising servants of the Lord. We are raising the next generation, the army of the Lord, that will carry on the work that we have begun. We are not going to finish it. They may not see the finish of it. And so it's a generational after generational training that needs to be taking place. Developing spiritual warriors, what are they? Well, they're people who have a heartfelt desire to please God. Uh, and to work with him in the battle for overcoming their own temptations, their own sin, and in the battle to bring more and more people to God and into his kingdom. A spiritual warrior is somebody who willingly submits to authority and sees that that is actually a help from God. He sees authority and submission to that authority as a benefit, as a safeguard for him, as providing a boundary in which it's safe for him to function and to experience the blessings of the Lord. He embraces it instead of having it imposed on him. 
He desires to be around others who fear the Lord. Uh, he wants fellowship with other Christians. Uh, he wants to follow the Lord not just when people are watching, but when they're not watching. Uh, if the obedience is from the outside, if it's because there is some kind of an external threat or there's some kind of external safeguard, when that safeguard is removed, he will simply turn and disobey. That's why so often we see children when they go off uh, to college, when they leave their families, they suddenly become very different children. And we wonder, how that happen? Well, they were always those kinds of children inwardly. We simply took the outward obedience as being an indication of what was in their heart, but it wasn't. I'm reminded of the story of a little girl who is insisting on standing up on the, in, on the seat in her, car, in her dad's car as they're driving along. The father says to the little girl, please sit down. It's dangerous for you to be standing up. No. Sit down, please. No. So finally he says to her, I'm going to stop the car and I'm going to make sure that you sit down. Well, she sits down. They're driving along, and after a little bit, she says to her dad, Daddy, I'm sitting down on the outside, but I'm still standing up on the inside. And that's what outward uh, obedience is. It's simply outward. It doesn't come from the heart. We want to have children who see from a biblical perspective, not just from their culture's way of looking at things. They look at things differently. We want them to have a correct view of their own strengths and weaknesses. We want them to be able to have an accurate evaluation of themselves and trusting in the Lord instead of trusting in themselves. I think there's also another false assumption that Christian parents can fall into. And that is, once our children have left the home, once they are grown, once they're out on their own, our job is done. We don't have to parent anymore. Parenting never stops. There are certain phases or times of life where parents are still very much needed. Uh, in their children's lives and where children, now grown, are needed in their parents' lives. The first of those is when a child has grown up and begins to look to make his way in the world. Maybe begins to look for a life's partner, to make uh, career choices, things like that. That is an especially good time for parents not to disappear but to gently provide instruction, maybe by first beginning to pray, to pray that their children would ask for their advice, would want to know what they think about this or that potential spouse, about this or that career choice, uh, to wait till they do and to perhaps stimulate those questions with a question here or there without being overbearing or without uh, bringing forth the idea that uh, they had the answers or that we as parents had the answers and our children just need to listen. There, uh, a good example of this is in Proverbs 5 through 7 where the father is instructing his uh, son in choosing the right kind of life's partner. Another time when parents are needed is when they become grandparents. When their children have children, this is especially a good time for parents to not hover, 
but to be available to help. Uh, this is a time when parents are just frazzled. And to have their grandparents, uh, their parents around to simply help in the physical needs can provide an opportunity, provide rest for them, and that opportunity where they begin to ask, how did you do this when I was growing up? And being able to give them that kind of a perspective then. Psalm 78 has a lot to say about the responsibilities of one generation training another generation to train another generation. Somehow, grandparents seem to have a real credibility with grandchildren. Grandchildren love, look up to them. They love them. They love being around grandparents. And grandparents have a wealth of experience to share with their grandchildren. They can teach them in a winsome way. They can teach them with stories of their own times of growing up and uh, of raising their the grandchildren's parents. Uh, we always want to communicate to our grandchildren a respect for their parents and so we need to be careful about what we reveal about their parents and uh, our raising them. Uh, we want to communicate uh, to our grandchildren wonderful biblical truths. It's an opportunity for teaching them about God's Word. Uh, reading God's Word to them. This might be a good time for you within the class to study one or more of the biblical instances of parents and grown children and their interactions to discover principles for intergenerational training. For example, Genesis 24, where Abraham finds a spouse for Isaac, or Genesis 27, where Isaac uh, passes on his blessing to his sons. You might want to look at Genesis 28, where Isaac helps Jacob to find a spouse. Uh, you might want to look at Leviticus 9, where Aaron teaches his grown sons how to do the priesthood. Uh, for Samuel chapter 8, where Samuel fails with his grown sons. Uh, 2 Samuel chapters 13 through 15, where David interacts with his grown sons and his failures to discipline those sons. We've now looked at marriage and family on a more long-term perspective. I hope that this has been a very helpful thing for you to not only see God's plan for you in your marriage and in your family, but to gain principles that you can pass on to your congregation. You want to be an example for them. You want to also be transparent with them and share with them how your family is not perfect. I think every church expects its family, its pastors and its leaders' families to be perfect, uh, and then becomes disappointed when they're not, we need to be, again, recognizing that the church is the training ground for the next generation of leaders. And we share with each other how to develop that next generation of leaders. It's, again, this whole idea of teamwork. And in families, parents need teamwork with each other and with others in the congregation. So I hope that this class has been especially beneficial to you. Thank you for your time. Goodbye.